Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to thank first the organizers of uh, this conference for, uh, for putting the, the, work, the, the, the conference together, first of all. So Andre Poama and Mark Antoine Dilak and Etienne Brown, thank you so much. I'm incredibly honored to be giving the keynote in front of uh, this distinguished group of scholars, um, including one of the founders of the field of epistemic democracy, David Esland, whose work has been so essential to my own work and without whom we wouldn't be here today. So thank you all uh, for having me, and I hope the, the little I have today won't disappoint. I'm interested in taking you to the frontier of my own research, where I have, have been pondering a series of puzzles, including the one I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, today. What publicity does for, or indeed sometimes to, the epistemic properties of deliberation, and specifically democratic deliberation. That is, how does the quality of being public affect the truth-tracking properties of democratic deliberation? Democratic deliberation is supposed to be the public exchange of arguments and reasons among free and equals. I borrow loosely from a definition uh, I found in, in Joshua Cohen. We now know quite a bit, I think, about the epistemic merits of deliberation as an exchange of reasons um, that occurs among free and equals. However, we don't know all that much, or so I will argue, about what the publicity element in this definition of democratic deliberation does for or to the epistemic value of democratic deliberation. What we do know from an already existing literature on the merits of publicity versus secrecy in general is that publicity can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, as Justice Brandeis famously put it, sunlight is the best disinfectant and electric light the most efficient policeman. Publicity is expected to have um, the same sanitizing <coughs> effects as sunlight. On the other hand, in some contexts at least, publicity can give participants the wrong incentives and take away from the epistemic properties we have come to expect from deliberation by preventing particip participants from being sincere about their views or by encouraging them to grandstand, refusing to change their minds, and resisting the unforced force of the better argument. Oftentimes, publicity will thus turn what is supposed to be a positive sum game participants in a deliberation all gain from getting closer to the truth to a zero sum one where the presence of an audience gives deliberators an incentive to care more about other things such as their image in the eyes of the public than, rather than, than the truth. So even though publicity is a cherished value of deliberative democrats, it will often come at the expense of the exp epistemic benefits of deliberation. Democratic deliberation, to the extent that it is by definition public, is more particularly vulnerable to this risk. And it could be that non-public deliberation has greater epistemic properties than public deliberation. So in this lecture, I would like first to briefly rehearse what we already know about the epistemic properties of deliberation, specifically democratic deliberation. Second, I would like to debate how these properties are likely to be affected by publicity in light of this double effect that we can expect from it. So to the extent that there's an argument to this lecture, it is that only a certain kind of publicity is likely to have epistemic properties, namely a publicity that is both distinct from complete transparency and immediate access, and combined with the principle of openness to the public's input. Indeed, the argument I conclude, conclude with is that publicity's main and perhaps only epistemic virtue in a representative context, which is the main context for uh, democratic deliberation these days, is, is to allow the public to eventually become part of the deliberation and bring to it additional information and arguments, thus enhancing the epistemic potential of whatever deliberation is going on. So let's recap first the epistemic properties of deliberation and specifically democratic deliberation. So deliberation means roughly the pondering and weighing of reasons or an exchange of arguments for or against a given view. It can refer to an internal dialogue in the vein of Robert Gooding calls deliberation within, an intersubjective exercise among individuals, or a discursive exchange occurring among entities larger than individuals, as in system thinking. Uh, that would be uh, what Jane Manbridge and John Parkinson have been writing about. But in this lecture, I focus strictly on deliberation as an intersubjective exchange among two individuals or more. The idea that deliberation as such an exchange of argument has epistemic properties is an old one, 
as, as you know, we can trace it back all the way to Aristotle's argument that a feast to which the many contribute is better than a feast organized by one person only, all the way to John Stuart Mill's em emphasis on diversity of points of views in helping the truth overcome falsities and triumph in a free market of ideas. An underlying assumption of these views is that there is a self-revealing nature of the truth, which when made appar apparent by the exchange of viewpoints, is supposed to convince all participants in the deliberation. Um, and this assumption is some, something best expressed perhaps by Habermas formula of the unforced force of the better argument. So given the crowd here, I'm not going to rehearse in great detail the argument as to how the unforced force of the better argument works in practice, but let us simply remind ourselves of the three things that deliberation is supposed to do. So first it's supposed to um, allow participants to weed out the good arguments, interpretations, and information from the bad ones. So just to use the jury example to legitimize your, your poster, um, <laughs> deliberation in that famous example, um, that, I, that I also use that example, so I, shows that the switchblade is not as distinctive a weapon as previously thought and can only be used a certain way, which is not the way the witness described. It is because of this property of, uh, of, this property of weeding out the good uh, from, from the, the bad from, from the good that deliberation turns out to be superior to mere judgment aggregation which simply averages out the bad and the good, whereas deliberation operates as a filtering mechanism. Second, deliberation can also produce synergies that is create new solutions out of the arguments, information, and solution brought to the table. Sometimes, in fact, hearing the perspective of others may entirely reshape a person's view of the problem and introduce possi possibilities not initially considered. So for example, in the jury, uh, 12 Angry Men's example, uh, deliberation makes sense of the impressions on the eyewitness nose in a way that proves decisive to the interpretation of her real reliability, because she turns out to be wearing glasses. In this way, deliberation is not superior, but complementary with judgment aggregation. There would sometimes be nothing to aggregate views on if deliberation hadn't performed the creative job of constructing the options, a task that judgment aggregation is not suited to. Finally, deliberation can, in the best case scenario, produce um, unanimous consensus on the right solution. So unanim uh, ultimately, the 12 angry men uh, unanimously vote not guilty. And even the most stubborn juror, a father with an anger problem and a strained relationship to his own son, breaks down, uh, that, that he projects onto the defendant, breaks down in tears at the end, symbolically vanquished by the force of the better argument. Note that it's not necessary for deliberation to yield consensus to have epistemic benefits. I, as I have argued in a paper with Scott Page, deliberation that ends with what we call positive dissensus may simply help participants refine the predictive models with which they approach a question, thus paving the way for more accurate aggregated predictions as a group. And all of this should be obvious once you see deliberation and majority rule as complementary rather than uh, rival epistemic procedures. The epistemic properties of deliberation work best under conditions of cognitive diversity with respect to the question at, at hand. Um, and in 12 Angry Men, again, all 12 jurors mattered in all their differences because it is only through the interplay between the conflicting interpretation of the evidence and argument that something like the truth ultimately emerges. And juror number eight, by himself or with a group of clones, would not have been able to reach the same conclusion. So there are many ways to formalize this logic uh, of deliberation under conditions of diversity. I've used uh, Lu Hong and Scott's page, uh, diversity trumps ability theorem, but another way to capture the same truth in a simpler way perhaps is this sp spatial metaphor of the passing of the baton between variously resourceful climbers on a rugged landscape. It's a great metaphor actually that I borrow from, uh, from um, Jerry Gauss, the t tyranny of the ideal. Whereas smart but homogeneously thinking problem solvers will tend to get stuck at high but local optima, the diverse group is more likely to have members guide each other from lower optima to the global one because as a group of diverse individuals, they explore more of the rugged landscape. The arguments above account for the epistemic properties of deliberation among cognitively diverse people, but it doesn't quite, they don't quite explain the specific epistemic properties of democratic deliberation, that is deliberation among equals. Um, in a public way. And I'm going to bracket the free part because actually I don't have much to say about that part, <laughs> what, what freedom does to this. 
Democratic deliberation in order to count as plausibly democratic thus requires two specific requirements, publicity of the exchanges and equal standing and equal opportunities for participation among participants. So in the example of 12 angry men, uh, you could say that the jurors' deliberation is not public and in that sense fails the democratic criterion even though they, they involve free and equal participants. Yeah. So again, what does equality specifically do for the epistemic properties of de deliberation? What does it change that deliberation takes place among equals rather than unequals? So I have offered in, in past work what I see as a missing link between the epistemic properties of deliberation and, and democrat democracy per se, at least when it comes to the inclusive and egalitarian features of de democratic deliberation. I uh, argued that more inclusive assemblies are simply more likely to be cognitively diverse and that considering the unpredictability of complex political questions and the resulting epistemic uncertainty um, facing inclusive assemblies, its inclusiveness needs to be done on an egalitarian basis. Every person included should be given the same right to speak and ultimately one vote and one vote only. Um, where all inclusiveness is not feasible because of time or space constraints, a second best solution, epistemically speaking, is delegation of the deliberative task to a randomly selected sample of the group. Why go for a random sample as opposed to a maximally diverse sample, you might ask? For the same reason that all are given equal right of speech and vote in the first scenario, oversampling along certain characteristics or forms of knowledge or competence is not robust to the uncertainty of political problems and will eventually lead to the epistemically mistaken exclusion of crucial perspectives. Egalitarian inclusiveness or its representative equivalent, random selection by contrast, are what I call ecologically rational. That is, it's an adaptive solution to the uncertain political environments that you, humans inhabit. So there are many objections to the argument, to all these arguments actually, that I'm not going to go into. But what should be clear is that we have a few theories explaining or attempting to explain the epistemic properties of deliberation among free and equals. Again, I think it's mostly among free, uh, among equals. I'm not sure that anybody's really focused on explaining what freedom does to the to the epistemic properties of deliberation. So if any one of you is interested in pursuing that, that's a research avenue right there. Um, so let me now turn to what we don't know all that much about and the main question I set out to address in, in this um, lecture, the epistemic properties of publicity. What does it do to or for deliberation among free and equals? So I take publicity to mean the property of someone or something being visible or at least accessible in some meaningful perceptual form to a relevant group in ways that are not overly burdensome. A public hearing, for example, is a formal meeting uh, for receiving testimony from the public at large on some issue or government action. The meeting is public in the sense that it is open to members of the community provided they come to the relevant time and place. Public records of, say, property taxes are public if they are accessible to all those who wish to see them. A park is public if it can be accessed by all members of a given community, even if there is a modest fee to enter it. By contrast, are not public closed or secret meetings, private properties, and private conversations, even if they happen to be reposted on Facebook, mm -hmm. which happens a lot. Publicity in the context of a democratic deliberation means that the content and participants in the deliberation are meant to be viewable, hearable, audible, or accessible in some other perceptual, perceptual form by all those who have the right and the inclination to access it. Note that publicity in democratic deliberation does not necessarily mean that the public is a participant in the deliberation. Thus, though presidential debates are public, the public itself is meant to be a silent observer of the exchange. Publicity is in fact, as a result, a remedial virtue to the, to the fact that not all can participate. Publicity is trivially verified in small enough deliberating groups where all can hear and participate. It is less trivially verified in large groups of, or, or meetings that not all can attend or participate. And that's why we have C-SPAN and all sorts of technologies to make the deliberation actually public. So publicity, one might say, is a democratic requirement that is made most acute in the context of representative rather than direct democracy. And I make two assumptions here that you should feel free to question. One is that deliberation to be democratic cannot be distributed over several disconnected subgroups, because I take it that it needs a centralizing moment where all are involved in the same conversation. So I don't buy this uh, system approach, for example. 
And two, mass online deliberation of all with all at once online is for now impossible. I, I don't know if it's even theoretically possible, but at least for now it seems um, impossible. So it turns out that publicity for all intent and purposes is first and foremost a remedial and instrumental property. Um, so as a, as a remedial and instrumental property, publicity is not an un unambiguous good, unlike, say, equality of the participants. Again, what does it do to or for the epistemic quality of um, deliberation? In most accounts, it is accepted that publicity ensures inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability of the deliberators to the public. Publicity, to paraphrase, uh, so I already so cited it, but the, it, it's seen as, as disinfect, disinfectant and, and, um, and it's supposed to guarantee honesty and public-mindedness of the deliberators. It is an instrument of the so-called politics of vigilance re recently re-emphasized, uh, recently emphasized by many authors in models of democracy that put a premium on civic spectatorship, on, on, this, on the gaze of the public. So um, I'm thinking of people like John Keynes and his monetary democracy model, uh, to uh, Pierre Rosan Vallon's counter democracy, to Jeff Green's ocular democracy. In these models, publicity is what keeps politicians virtuous. But if publicity is a good thing for the politics of vigilance necessary in modern representative democratic polities, Again, what does it do to the epistemic properties of deliberation? That is, its ability to get us closer to the truth. Um, there are some skeptical conclusions here from the literature that I'd like to review. I borrow from Jan Elster, uh, surprisingly, maybe. Uh, <laughs> he considered that there are potentially three benefits of publicity. One is uh, it forces honesty in the context of the politics of distrust and vigilance that I just mentioned. That's re really the, the same line as Brandeis and, and Bentham's uh, view, as well as all, all these authors I just mentioned. Second, according to Elster, publicity has a civilizing effect on deliberators, who may eventually come to practice what they are forced to preach, um, uh, namely caring for the public good. So here, I think uh, it's a different uh, meaning of publicity than the one I'm really interested in here. He's concerned about the publicity of the object and the, the sort of uh, uh, type of argumentation that's uh, put forward. And I would mention that um, even though that's an argument he makes for publicity in that sense, he, he's actually retracted it recently. So he no longer believes, uh, Elsa no longer believes in the civilizing force of, uh, of hypocrisy. So in that same article, he also uh, um, argued that publicity uh, at least curbs the most egregious expression of self-interest. Um, and here he understands it both in the sense of like being public and, and uh, a certain style of, uh, of argumentation. So these are all important advantages, although they seem to me only indirectly epistemic, creating the condition for arguments to be exchanged in a proper way, that is creating the condition for an orientation towards the truth. By contrast, in Elster's view, there are specifically epistemic costs to publicity, and they are high. Publicity tends to lower the quality of exchange arguments. Uh, he quotes uh, approvingly Madison, who reportedly said that no constitution would ever have been adopted by the convention had the debates been public. This is so because, I quote again, had the members committed themselves publicly at first, they would have afterwards supposed consistency required them to maintain their ground, whereas by secret discussion, no man felt himself obliged to retain his opinions any longer than he was satisfied of their propriety and truth, and was open to the force of, an ar of argument. So for Esther, secrecy, not publicity, guarantees the willingness of deliberators to surrender to the compelling force of the better argument. By contrast, publicity causes can't and grandstanding on many issues because of des people's desire for popularity and their fear of retaliation for unpopular positions. These concerns are well illustrated by the 1789 French Assembly constituent where the defeat of, uh, I, I quote um, again, the defeat of bicameralism and of the executive veto in Paris was due partly to the fact that many delegates feared for their lives if they voted in favor of these proposals. There are also um, examples of this in the modern age. Um, so there's a study uh, that shows that in the Arab world, the increasing publicity of constitutional processes from the second half of the 20th century onward gave uh, a boost to the, I quote, a boost to the Islamic infla inflationary trend in constitutional texts. It's a study by Brown from 2016. So on the one hand, publicity forces deliberation to focus on arguing and exchanging arguments about the common good, as opposed to veering into self-interested bargains and compromises. 
But at the same time, publicity can be expected to lower the quality of whatever is argued. As a result, the epistemic net effect of publicity is indeterminate, concludes Elster. If anything, if anything where self-interest can be seen as a lesser issue, for example, on constitutional matters, where the causal chains between general principles and individual interests are too uncertain to make out, such as a choice between, say, unicameralism or, or bicameralism, epistemic concerns dictate that one actually prefers secrecy and opacity of the deliberations. It is only for ordinary legislation, where self-dealing is most to be feared, that publicity seems desirable, although its epistemic benefits are largely indirect and its epistemic costs virtually certain. These conclusions are sobering. Yet, one must keep in mind that they are reached by generalizing from the study of very specific historical events and may fail to apply in distinct contexts. In the recent Icelandic experiment of constitution writing, uh, I'll say more on, on about it shortly, publicity seemed, on the contrary, to have been an epistemic enhancer rather than an epistemic spoiler. So I think there is um, room for, uh, for more optimism, actually. Additionally, these conclusions do not make much of the distinctions introduced by Elster himself between different kinds of publicity and seem instead to rely on a definition of publicity that equated with immediate accessibility of the debates to the public, as was the case of the French Assembly Constituant who allowed a live audience to stand in the galleries of their meeting place. Finally, the strict focus on the perspective of deliberators within the room fails to take into account the epistemic value of public deliberation for the larger public itself and, and somewhat indirectly um, for the deliberators as a result of the influence of that external public. It may well be the case that publicity, publicity spoils the epistemic quality of the people directly involved in the deliberation, but it seems nonetheless of import that publicity makes available to the public arguments and information that would otherwise remain hidden, ensuring both that they become common knowledge, which is very important uh, in contexts where pluralistic ignorance is a risk, I'm thinking uh, especially the Ar Arab countries or illiberal societies, and are scrutinizable and improvable by the public at large. Even if we assume that democratic deliberation is only possible and meaningful among the relevant set of representatives, we nonetheless have to remember that those are elected by the public. Additionally, most deliberative democracy models assume some influence of public opinion on the deliberation of representatives, even outside of electoral cycles. A more informed public can only improve, at least on such models, uh, the epistemic quality of deliberations among elected free and equal. So th there might be, again, this uh, tension between the direct benefits, the indirect um, benefits. So in order to better ascertain what the likely epistemic effects of publicity are overall, I propose to distinguish between dif different <coughs> kinds of publicity. So I have, um, not sure how to call them really, but one is publicity as full transparency to an audience which I'm, I'm sure you've understood by now that it's really not that epistemically promising. And then um, publicity as a form of lag transparency, uh, and I'll, I'll say more about it soon. But when it comes to the first one, I wanted to distinguish um, different kinds of transparency even. So there's publicity as full transparency to an audience that, is, uh, that can be uh, a live audience and can react or be silent, or a virtual audience which exists in real time when the deliberations are live, live streamed on the internet, for example, or projected, projected into the future when the deliberation is recorded for delayed broadcast. Um, and this I don't know of systematical empirical evidence supporting the respective epistemic merits and demerits of these various forms of publicity. I will now follow a more speculative strategy, which means that I'm gonna engage in armchair uh, <laughs> <laughs> theory. First, I try to imagine counterfactually what would have happened to the 12 jurors in the uh, model that uh, I use in my book if instead of secret deliberations, they had exchanged their reasons publicly in these various senses of publicity. Second, I try to imagine counterfactually what would have happened to the quality of the recent public debates between Trump and Clinton um, had the, public of the, the publicity of the deliberation been of a different kind than exposure to a silent but live audience. <coughs> Both thought experiments suggest that extreme publicity in the sense of full exposure to the public is bad, epistemically speaking. But publicity in a more restricted sense may present some epistemic advantages. 
Finally, moving on to the context of constitution making, where publicity is supposed to have the least epistemic promise, according to Elster, I put forward a, uh, uh, what I take to be a strong counter example, uh, the, the Icelandic example. So let's first go back to the 12 jurors. What would have happened if they had had a real live audience allowed to cheer and boo in reaction to the debates? On the positive side, many of the jurors might have checked some of the more egregious or uncalfed behavior. Juror number seven, who is eager to get it over with and um, uh, because he wants to be out of the courtroom in time to catch a Yankees game, would probably have uh, shown more civic mindedness and tried harder to contribute to the conversation. Juror number three, the bully of the group, who at one point threatens to kill another juror, would probably have toned it down uh, his, uh, his behavior too and stopped using um, intimidating tactics. On the other hand, there are plenty of other behavior that publicity in the sense of being exposed to a live responsive audience might induce that are directly at odds with epistemic benefits. It's not clear that juror number eight would have dared raising his initial dissent, which started the deliberation. He might have been drawn out by a worked up crowd and failed to find support among the other jurors for revisiting the case. Worse, what if the racist jurors rant against those people had been met with cheers and applauses? What if the bullying of other jurors by number three had been actually rousing the crowd? Publicity in the sense of being exposed to a live, responsive audience risks encouraging demagoguery of the worst kind. So it's not surprising maybe that presidential debates require the crowd to be silent. So we can probably rule out publicity as unmediated exposure to a live, interactive audience as an obvious e epistemic spoiler, notwithstanding the fact that, that this is how ancient Greeks <coughs> made their decisions. It would be interesting to see how they actually uh, were not uh, suffering so much from, the, from those problems. So if anything, the presence of a live audience will make it harder to generate good epistemic outcomes. What about the physical presence of a silent audience? I just, as just mentioned, it is the norm for presidential debates. Most, um, where, where most of the chatter and uproar uh, today are instead uh, happening not in the public, but uh, on, on this other public on Twitter, which speakers do not have access to at the time of the debate, uh, thus remaining somewhat insulated from the real-time effect of their words and unable to adjust accordingly. The fact that live crowds are silent during presidential debates, however, may not amount to much of a justification for the epistemic merits of this kind of publicity, given how little exchange of arguments there actually is in presidential debates. Jeffrey Green, the, the author of The Eyes of the People, uh, was written about the need to elicit more candor from our political leaders in order to empower what he calls the gaze of the people, does not seem to believe that the problem lies in the presence of the physical audience as much as the nature of the questions that are asked of the candidates. Uh, Green proposes instead of uh, uh, asking them questions to implement the practice of cross-examination whereby candidates would be encouraged to ask questions of each other as opposed to answering the questions of a third party. But he too requires the crowd to be silent. I'm, I'm skeptical that a silent live crowd is less epistemically problematic than, than a vocal one but it does seem like, a, like an improvement. So what about the presence of a virtual public, one that is either one step removed from the action when the content is live streamed or, or twice removed when the content is both filmed and broadcast with a delay? My hunch is that the more mediations there are, the better epistemically speaking, as it desensitizes posturing, grandstanding, sophistry, and emotional rhetoric on the part of the deliberators, and thus makes for more sober conversation. Here, the trade-off is likely to be between a better epistemic content, but a possibly lesser engagement of the audience, because they may not watch something that feels a bit too disconnected or, or yesterday, or dated. All in all, however, the main problem with publicity as exposure to a live or virtual audience is the exhaustive transparency of visual access, which gives the audience access to everything that is being said and done during a deliberation. This complete transparency is likely to come with various epistemic costs. First, it encouraged deliberators to focus as much on their looks as what they are going to say, considering what we know of the credibility surplus that audiences tend to give people with good and polished looks. It is well known that during the Kennedy-Nixon debates, there was a huge discrepancy in the assessment of who won the debates between radio listeners and TV watchers. The TV watchers thought Kennedy won, and of course, the radio listener thought Nixon won. Second, publicity in that visual sense encourages deliberators to say as much with their body language, eye rolls, physical menacing presence, smirks, 
as with their speeches, which is bound to considerably dilute what can be inferred from the rational content of the exchange. It arguably even dilutes the publicity of the content by diminishing the quantity of what is explicitly said and thus open for discussion. Publicity as full exposure to an audience is thus overall, I would argue, likely to be an epistemic spoiler rather than an epistemic enhancer because of all the biases that sight allows us to bring in the conversation. Okay, let us now turn to an understanding of publicity as the more restricted concept of av availability of the relevant information in the form of, say, detailed transcripts of the participants' exchange of reasons and arguments. Here, one could argue that publicity in this uh, more restricted sense has epistemic advantages over secrecy, strictly aside from what it does to the motivation and honesty of participants. The main epistemic advantage is to give an incentive to the deliberators to make factually and logically correct statements, as opposed to emotionally rousing claims, sophism, or even downright lies, to appeal to reason as opposed to passions. Because, because publicity in that sense is not visibility and because it is delayed rather than immediate, the deliberators are encouraged to focus on the content of what they say than, um, th than on the way they say it or what they look like saying it. The second epistemic advantage follows from the first. To the extent that the content of the deliberation is of higher epistemic quality, the public is likely to learn more and develop more informed opinions. That is perhaps the greatest epistemic benefit of publicity, its educational effect on the larger public and the possible feedback loop that it generates on the deliberation of the representatives. Now, the same way we imagine how the 12 angry jurors would have deliberated in the presence of an actual live public, let us imagine how a debate between Trump and Clinton could have gone in the absence of a live audience and instead with the kind of publicity that facilitates quality deliberation. Um, so let's, let us imagine that all Trump and Clinton know that their exchange will be known by posterity at some point, which will be the very minimal form of publicity. So consider first an exchange that actually happened on TV. Clinton said to Trump, I I'm summarizing, you're buying steel from China and evading corporate taxes. Trump in return said, and I'm, I'm like literally quoting, that's called smart business, uh, or I'm smart, something like that, and you had 30 years to change corporate tax law, so if you didn't like it, why didn't you do anything about it? There's another exchange I want to look at, which is um, when the moderator asked, uh, to Clint asked Clinton, what do you have to say about the accusations of corruption coming from WikiLeaks? And Clinton, as a, sort of basically as a, her answer was to evade the question entirely by pivoting to her 30 years, to her 30 years of experience in government. The exchanges in these sequences have little to no argumentative content. They are barb, zingers, flying accusations, or rhetorical maneuvers that are meant to score points as opposed to engage and convince the interlocutor or the audience. But if the public was twice removed from the deliberator, here is how one can speculate or hope that the exchanges could have gone. So Clinton says you're, to Trump, you're buying steel from China and evading taxes. So he could have, Trump could have answered, I'm doing what any businessman is allowed to do in this country. Why are you holding me to standards of ethics that the law is supposed to entrench and still hasn't because of people like you who are too corrupt to fix the system? What I'll do as a president is close all those corporate loopholes I enjoyed as a private businessman. Um, Clinton, in return, could have said, the reason why I didn't try to change the law is because I would have failed at the time and wouldn't have stayed in power long enough to fight people like you. If I become president, I will then have the power to change things more radically. You, however, will have a massive conflict of interest. So now if we turn to the other exchange, uh, the moderator and, and Clinton, what do you have to say about the accusations of corruption coming from WikiLeaks? One answer that I was expecting, but of course, uh, oh, the was dream, she could have said, well, I'm, I'm corrupt, I'm, but I'm only corrupt because the system is corrupt. The same way that Trump is allowed to evade taxes, I'm legally allowed to take money from people who will then ask me for favor when I'm in power. Most politicians do it because we live in a in such a system, and there is no other way to access power in this country than through money. I'm a pragmatist, since I'm not a billionaire who became rich unjustly by being given an unfair advantage at birth, not paying fair wages, and exploiting corporate loopholes. My only alternative is to charge uh, half a million dollars per speech to corporate stooges, I accept a position on Walmart board, and take donations from places like Qatar. It's not pretty, but at least I'm for progressive policies. That would have convinced me more. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, in a way, this is roughly the subtext behind what was actually said, but it makes a difference that it was never said in such terms. The debates never really touched the real questions and so failed the two epistemic goals of bringing the deliberators and their audience closer to a form of truth. How would, how do, so how, question that should have been raised, how do we change the system so that politicians don't need to depend on wealthy donors in order to ac access and retain power and can make decisions that, that benefit us all as opposed to these same donors? How do we change the system such that rich businessmen can systematically game it by buying either politicians who will, who will manipulate the law or lawyers who will figure out loopholes? If we could have this conversation, maybe we would make some progress towards figuring out a solution. Uh, some have suggested replacing elections with sorticians, things like that, and just, you know, we could at least have a conversation. Instead of which we are left with tangential conversations about the corruption of Clinton, which is much less problematic than the corruption of the system itself, and the unethical in business dealings of a Trump, which are themselves much less problematic than the system that allows, it, uh, allows them. Now, how do we get as close to an honest and informative exchange like this one while reducing the distance between the deliberators and the public? I'm not sure. It's partly a matter of changing cultural expectations and training the public to accept and reward honesty in politicians. This seems to have worked uh, for Sanders for a while, and to a small degree, Trump himself, who for all his lies, was generally perceived as rejecting political correctness and telling it like it is. Maybe the resounding defeat of Clinton does mark the end of wooden speak of the kind even Obama was guilty of. In any case, it might be that from an, epi from an epistemic perspective, the politics of vigilance that require publicity as immediate visibility actually comes at a high epistemic cost uh, when it comes to ordinary politicians. What about less ordinary politics, namely constitution making? Here, um, Elster argues, and he's not the only one, that the, the politics of vigilance can be relaxed in that opacity and secrecy do not necessarily harm honesty and in fact ensure that a greater quality of arguments are exchange, uh, is, is exchanged. Constitution making is supposed to be the case where publicity has the least expected epistemic value. So here I would like to briefly introduce the, the, the example of, uh, of Iceland. So during uh, four months in 2011, the 25 members of the Constitutional Council in charge of writing a constitutional proposal went out of their way to publicize the content of the deliberation. It was a very unusual move. Not only that, but they explicitly sought input from the public on their work, combining the principle of publicity with what I call the principle of openness, namely, namely the, the openness to both the gaze and the voice of the larger public. They did so, however, in a manner that was not entirely immediate and thus avoided some of the dangers associated with publicity as full transparency and exposure that I outlined before. So they never allowed anyone in the room where they were writing the draft. And in that sense, they didn't have to suffer the physical pressure of a live audience. What they did instead is stream the deliberation of the plenary assembly online and put out PDF transcripts <coughs> of the committee meetings um, afterwards. They preferred a mediated form of publicity combined with what might be termed lag transparency, whereby the full content of their deliberation was made available, but only with a substantial delay. Finally, they also chose to crowdsource their drafts on an online platform, allowing the large public, the larger public to, to access their work and make suggestions and comments about it at very specific times in purely written form and generally under very controlled circumstances. The, the, um, there was some moderation of the site. Uh, it was not just a um, completely open um, and unregulated site. The end result was that publicity improved the content of the draft, in my reading, by allowing people to make informed comments on the constitutional proposal and making the drafter somewhat accountable for the choices to the larger public. Publicity in that case proved superior to secrecy because it allowed for inputs to make it in, for public input to make it into <coughs> the final draft. And that, that input, I would argue, improved the quality of the draft. For example, a number of rights, so a right to the internet, uh, animal rights, children's rights, transsexual rights, transgender rights, would not have made it into the proposal if it hadn't been for the public and open nature of the process. Uh, so one thought this counterexample prompts is that the merit of publicity is not so much in the effect it had on the deliberators per se, as in the fact that it is a precondition for useful input from the crowd, 
which in turn may epistemically improve the deliberations of the constitution makers. Conversely, publicity <coughs> did not lead in this case to the predicted epistemic spoilers, namely grandstanding or inability to change one's mind. Even live streaming did not seem to encourage any act of vanity on the part of the participants who remained their ordinary selves throughout, though of course this may be due to very specific cultural norms against this sort of behavior um, being particularly strong in Iceland. As to the risk of letting in the crowd via Facebook page, among other things, it was done in such a way, uh, again through some degree of moderation and by rem reminding participants uh, of the rule of the platform regularly, that the amount of trolling seemed to have been minimal. The Icelandic case, to my mind, invalidates the claim that publicity has little, no, or even negative um, uh, epistemic value in the context of constitution making. Whether it has great epistemic value beyond the thought experiments, an example outlined here is a question open to further research. So uh, we know quite a lot about the epistemic properties of deliberation, specifically, I would argue, those uh, of deliberation among, among equals. We know still very little, however, about what publicity does for and to these epistemic properties, especially considering that the value of publicity only re really matters in the, in the represent representative context where the public becomes separate from the deliberators. I have argued that before reaching any conclusion, one should probably introduce a distinction between publicity per se and the immediacy of full transparency. Often the two are conflated and maybe there are different types of publicity, one of which is full transparency. Um, and I think presidential debates are, are a good example of why full transparency doesn't really work. Um, but if we separate publicity from transparency and immediacy, there is a case to be made for delayed rather than immediate publicity and for limited as opposed to full transparency, where the focus would be on information and arguments. Diminishing the sense of spectacle and delaying the broadcasting of the conversation would probably make for a more constructive conversation, in part because deliberators wouldn't be able to count uh, on, on the rousing effects and emotional effects of their, of their remarks. Another conclusion is that publicity's epistemic merits may be more um, <coughs> in it being a precondition for popular participation of a certain kind rather than its effects on the deliberators themselves. In this sense, openness to popular participation might be the real epistemic enhancer here, whereas publicity is mostly its instrumental precondition. Thank you very much. Do you, do you prefer to take questions individually or? Um, sure, yeah. or maybe. Kevin. Thanks. Uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, very interesting. Uh, and I have just a couple of questions, a uh, small, small uh, suggestion and a question. Uh, one, is there any important difference between publicity and transparency? Uh, so you're mentioning this a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, and one other thing, um, I wonder what we can learn from the changes that happened with the, the Fed meetings. Do you know about this? No. How so the, the Fed the, the Fed board used to have their meetings entirely. Um, let's see, it was unrecorded private. Um, excuse me, it was recorded, but it was the recordings were never released to the public. Yeah. And then that changed. Oh yeah, in I heard that. 1974 yeah. or something. And then they began releasing transcripts like with like a six month or a 10 year, it was like some crazy six months, uh, it was a big difference, but uh, with, a, with a lag. And what, what you ended up, there's some great paper on this that shows that what you ended up having was in earlier, because we have these transcripts going way back, uh, we see these like freewheeling conversations where people are just throwing out crazy ideas, like central bankers, right, uh, being, you know, crazy the way that they get. Um, and, then, uh, and then once you have incumbents aware of what they're saying isn't going to be public today, but will be at some point in the future, yeah. you get them sitting there and reading statements. And they're, they're much, less, ah, really? okay. much less candid. Um, and you might think that that came with some epistemic Cost. uh, costs. But anyway, I wonder what you think. Mm. Um, yes, so I... I that's that's a problem, right? It's, it's if, if all the interesting conversation then happen in uh, over coffee when it's not, not recorded or between you know in corridors and it, it is a problem. Um, 
I don't. I, I think I've saw some papers on, on that specific uh, change, and my impression was that on the. Con I mean, I, I had a feeling that it didn't change their behavior all that much, actually. So maybe they are mixed. Uh, it's, it's possible. This is my re recollection. That okay, that so I have the opposite recollection, though, that they, they, you know, six months a year, it's it's long enough that uh, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on the on the gravity of the decisions that are made, maybe, or how accountable they're, they're made to be. Um, yeah, so there's a trade-off right there, for sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what to say. I, I just My sense also is that sometimes there are some people who are completely, uh, that their behavior won't change. You, you take a, somebody, okay, it's not a good example, but that's the one that's coming to mind, uh, Anthony Weiner, like you put a camera in front of him, he will still say everything that's on his mind. And I actually suspect that a lot of people are like that. So you might have some cautious, more cautious types, but you, you would still get more information than less. So I think that the trade-off might be on balance worth it. I'm not sure. It's a empirical question. Miles Grid's selection bias for people like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK, true. Yeah, I just have a small set of issues about trying to understand this idea of um, delayed publicity. Yeah. And you have a couple different categories of it. And I think I probably missed some of the nuance. Um, so one puzzle that occurred to me is that the Posterity publicity, like this really weak, yeah. really extended delay, and what, what epistemic effects might it have? But the example you gave there was the debate between Trump and Clinton. It's like, it doesn't make any sense to have a debate. Like, what are they doing? So it's really hard to understand epistemic effects. Like, what are they doing? But that, that might not be fatal for the idea of posterity publicity. You might just want a different example where people mm. are in a room and they have to make a decision, they have to debate. Right. And then what would it do to either allow this to someday be publicized or not? That, so, so that's a coherent question, but that example is really weird. Okay. Um, and then I wonder if you, this idea of lag publicity, and I might have just missed the way you defined it. In the Iceland case, it's lag in a way because the public isn't seeing the meetings in real time, or sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But the epistemic effects you wanted to some of the epistemic effects you wanted to look at were where people from the public could hear what was said, say something back, and still be part of the ongoing deliberative process. So in one sense, it's not lag at all. It's just yeah. a very slow process. It's like a week between. Yeah. Um, but I don't, but, so I think you need maybe some other, a little more fine-grained thing. It's still lag in a way. There's nobody hearing it as it happens, and that might have epistemic effects of its own. So we distinguish between something like what we're, you know, ongoing lag publicity, which is the yeah. one where, you know, and ex post lag publicity, and that posterity would be an extreme version of that, something like that. No, okay, so, so that, you're right. I think the example is, uh, is a bit absurd, but I was just trying to, um, to, sh to, to like, if, if you move the cursor, you know, in terms of like, from like a few minutes to, to 100 years, I guess, you know, I just wanted to have like a sense of how rational you could make this debate if you, if you give them as much. Yeah. But we can't think of what their motives are in that debate. It's secret. Till their mm -hmm. career is over. Like, what are they, how are we supposed to think long. what they would do? What are their motives? What kind right. of debate is it? Yeah. No, so I agree this is, this is not a good example. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. so, um, and then yes, I, I'm, I thank you for suggesting those, uh, those further sort of distinctions. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess there's, you know, there's, there's, there's two dimensions. Like, there's a dimension of um, opacity, like, do you, do, do I think the more we move toward a written form, the more comfortable I am with it, actually. I think uh, a, mo a more written form. Mm -hmm. So make, make politics less of a spectacle, in a way, or make, make the deliberation less of a spectacle. Like, disembody it. I mean, you know, and, and I'm sure there are trade-offs, and you know, so some people have objected to me that, well, you're losing the spectacle dimension, and it's really a part of the, what, what gets us interested and motivated, and therefore you're gonna lose some epistemic properties if you make that so boring. But then on the other hand, I feel like, I have faith in, uh, in online the potential of online deliberation in, in helping people come together uh, in a sort of uh, in a way that allows them to come at any point in time and, and is still centralized and organize their thoughts through 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 te through technological means really like you can have this uh, very logically organized sp space for for debate and so it seems to me like the more we move to a, to a written form of that kind the the, the the greater the epistemic gains are, whereas if it remains oral, if it remains face to face, if it remains influenced by all these social dimensions that, that are, you know, that are, that are, that, that are 
shaping the, the face to face deliberation, I think we're, we're, there's a great loss of uh, epistemic um, potential. Oh, uh, and then the other one, yeah. So the one was the opacity. You want to, you know, not get to full secrecy, but like maybe mediate a bit more. And then the, the time thing, the time dimension. Right. And and then you're right. I mean, waiting for posterity is too long. Uh, a few months might be just the right thing. I'm not sure. I think it's also an empirical question of how much is going to affect the, the behavior of people in the room. I, I I guess you might you might time it in proportion to the the. The half-life of emotions, and so we put it. You know, like you wait for for the for the uproar and the passion to die out, and then you you let it be known. Seems to me it's much more institutionally specific and contextual than that. Like, is there an ongoing deliberation over this time yeah. frame that we're considering mm -hmm. making it? But or is it after the decisions have been made? Right. It's a matter oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. for historians. So there's not going to be any right answer of like how long is ideal and how long do emotions last and all that. Right? There's not going to be one answer. It depends on, right? If the, is the deliberation still going on will be a big determinant of what would be too long to wait. Right. Well, but it's, for some decisions that are going to, you know, to war, I mean, there's a time at which the deliberation is right. over and it's gone. So, right. Know, it's just and others take month, you know, month, months or years are still deciding. Yeah. Okay. Okay, one other thing you introduced to which you didn't, I might have missed it in the paper, is textual versus non-textual. Because that yes. textual without any visuals yeah. can be in real time, too. So that's a different mm -hmm. distinction. Um, hey, uh, thanks so much. This is great, uh, as always. Um, so I, um, I wonder how um, competing normative uh, demands might uh, change the need for publicity. Uh, so I think in my own life, on Facebook, I don't post everything to everyone because I know that not all arguments or claims are going to be amenable to all my friends. Um, so I can imagine. Um, I want, as a policymaker, I want expanded sexual education in uh, American high schools. Um, and I might have two reasons for it. I might think that it enhances um, students' right to choose, that they're just in possession of more information, um, and they can do with that uh, what they will to make better decisions about their sexual lives. Um, but I know that the Catholics um, in the school district um, won't be amenable to a right to choose. And so I'll have to say that actually there's actually empirical evidence um, that uh, terminated pregnancies actually decline when there's um, uh, when there's enhanced sexual education. So if I were to make this, that those two arguments um, at a town hall meeting um, in my school district, I think both sides would get upset with me. Uh, one said, "What's the problem with in, uh, increased uh, terminated pregnancies? Uh, fetuses aren't." Uh, are autonomous individuals and they don't uh, deserve that kind of respect, why is that a consideration? And Catholics would say, why do we want to instantiate the right to choose? That's something which is inimical to us. But if we partition our, our discussions, uh, making each argument separately, it's actually going to great, create greater coalition and endorsement of our policies. Um, and so I, I wonder that there are some times where just because of the competing uh, normative commitments of the audience, it actually, it actually helps um, to, uh, to bifurcate the discursive pro uh, process and, and actually limit publicity. Mm. So in order to get to, to what, what's the goal you're trying to The goal is, so the, in, the, in, the, in the toy example is, is sexual education. Um, so I want, to, I want to roll out enhanced sexual education uh, in my school district, and I can do it. I can get these two, the, uh, these two coalitions to sign on. I just, I'm just going to make different arguments to them. But if I made both arguments uh, pooled, um, I might actually get individ like in, an individual constituency to peel off. I see. Well, so that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Um, then aren't we back to this um, thing about Propaganda and like the sort of persuasion techniques you're using, and uh, I don't know. I'm, I, maybe instrumentally, it sounds like a good idea. I just find that um, a bit worrying that we can't have a conversation on both dimensions. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good answer. It's, okay. a, it's an interesting <laughs> counterexample. I'll just uh, insert myself in the list. So. One question about, <coughs> this is not about publicity, but you, you list unanimous consensus as one of the virtues of deliberation, uh, or one of the advantages of deliberation. No. <laughs> when I say information, 
Oh no, it can, occasionally, <laughs> it can occasionally result in. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's rare and probably uh, it's not to be achieved by at the Oh, okay. okay. So that was just uh, um, then on the definition of publicity. When you say so, you define it as being visible to a relevant group in ways that are not burdensome. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering if relevant is the word there, because on if you define if you strictly define publicity like that, then a jury would be. You could argue that a jury is, in some sense, public, right? Because the relevant people are the co-deciders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering whether you're not looking for something like indefinite, so anyone can sort of be part of the public. The, OK, I was thinking more in terms of who's, who's the demos. Okay. So you know, it's like affected. I don't know if it's affected. Whoever, wh whatever is the sort of relevant <coughs> group, you know, you want it, it's public if it's uh, with respect to that group, so mm -hmm. the, the Icelanders, but not necessarily uh, the whole planet. Yeah. You know. So why not? Um, because I guess a public is a public. It's not just a crowd, and uh, it's got to be un uni united by some, some, mm. something <laughs> that makes it a public as opposed to um, a crowd. But the inclusion, the inclusion criterion, uh, can be. Uh, we can we can disagree on who counts as the relevant public for sure. Mm. So the last point is this question about uh, lag transparency being more effective than sort of simultaneous uh, transparency. Um, I just don't see why we, we would care about our future selves <coughs> so much. Um, if you look at people like, so that, that seems to work with a, an assumption that I care about how my future self is going to be perceived by people, right? either in six months or two years. You are tend to sort of discount. But, but, but we tend to think that it's irrational to discount completely your future self, no? I mean, th I think actually people, especially politicians, care about their, their posterity, their legacy. I mean, some of them do it mostly for that. I mean, there's the mm. power aspect, but there's also the what kind of legacy you, know, you, you have and how you're treated by history books. And I think they should care. At least we should give them incentives to care. So institutionally, I think it's it's probably possible to design, you know, procedures yeah. in, in a way that, that they would care. And, and I'm just not sure yeah. that that's a very realistic assumption. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. Go. No, go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So be careful you because your your record is so the <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm going to have uh, evidence that you. Uh, okay, that's uh, really <laughs> terrific, and I really like uh, uh, the way I mean, the, 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 the debate around uh, publicity can go on uh, forever. There are so many uh, possible ways of exploring this. Uh, two things. First is, um, well, uh, what does it mean to be public? I mean, uh, we all. Uh, have, for example, in France, we have uh, all, all the exams are public in uh, public universities, and they are public. It doesn't mean that everybody can come in, but there is a witness, someone uh, who is there to. Uh, I am a member of many <coughs> juries in Brussels for the uh, allocation of grants, uh, of research grants, and they are public. These are public juries, public decision. Doesn't mean. Uh, so we are basically five or seven. We are selected uh, 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 with all possible, through all possible criteria, gender, nationality, age, uh, discipline, uh, etc. Also, to, in all, uh, order to have balanced juries, there is always uh, a witness from the European Commission uh, that uh, that uh, attends all our discussions. Uh, and uh, a witness from other uh, influence groups. And uh, are they public? But if we are not exposed to the public. So I would like to uh, uh, push you on the difference between publicity and public exposure. And also public ex exposure in the way in which you're uh, talking about it, and especially in your, your case and corner factor case about the, 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 the TV debate, uh, Visual exposure is still is even something else. I mean, uh, there is a very good book uh, that maybe you know by uh, uh, 
colleague sociologist in France, uh, uh, Nathalie Heineck, on de la visibilité, on visibility. The, 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 the dimension of uh, being seen is something that is phenomenologically very rich. Many things that are not public become uh, visible. I mean, I go, uh, it happens to me to go on television, for example, in Italy. Uh, I have uh, things to say and I have my own age, for example. I don't want my age to be public, but I mean my age becomes public because <laughs> I go to the television and then I receive messages and uh, I don't know, from the uh, public, uh, very often very nasty about the fact uh, that why old ladies are invited to television to talk about. Yeah, and so, I mean, there are things of yourself that can become public without yeah. you wanting what to be public, and these are really phenomenological properties of, uh, of uh, visibility. Public exposure as visibility is something that is phenomenological, very special, very Goffmanian, if you want. There is a Goffmanian dimension of, how, of uh, the presentation of yourself uh, to... Uh, and, and last, uh, about uh, your very interesting points and research about the Iceland case, what the Iceland case tells us about uh, the rest of the world, given that these people are 300,000 very cultivated, <laughs> cultivated people with an internet penetration of 98% in the society. So they are perfect human beings. And, I mean, <laughs> how can you uh, extend your case, I don't know, to Italians or other kind of populations? OK, great. Um, Hmm. So I really like your point about the phenomenological property of some of our attributes that you know they're visible even though you don't necessarily want them to be public. Yeah. That just, I, 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 just to me that just reinforces the attractiveness of um, a publicity that is not full exposure precisely. Exactly. Because I think that the reason why our public sphere is, is mostly you know uh, white men and you know it, it's part so it's partly you know socioeconomic reasons and but it's also I think um, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> You cannot escape a certain, sure, yeah. I don't know, I would call it like objectification or something like that. And if you can just, it can just be about reasons and argument, it's much simpler. Um, uh, so I don't know. Um, and then the, the so, so I think I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of uh, distinguishing publicity and, and pub public exposure. I think that that's, that, that I agree with you. On the, on the Icelandic example, I get that question a lot. <laughs> I mean, okay. sure, I, I'm happy to grant that this is a best case scenario. Mm -hmm. But, you know, th they're trying something new and then there are all these questions about can it work in a larger country? Can, can those experiments, uh, experimental aspects of their constitutional process scale? Would it work in a more divided country? I mean, these are all open. I don't, I don't think we should close the debate and say, look, this is the best case scenario, therefore it has nothing to teach us. Right? I think on the contrary, it's the beginning of a conversation. And on the scalability issue, I think I can already answer that in my view, it's perfectly scalable. You just need um, uh, what's called uh, data sensing softwares sure. to filter out, you know, if, if, because they only had like a few thousand comments. That's fine. If you have, in Egypt, they tried it too in 2012, they had 65,000 comments. It's much, much harder. When, when you get to millions, if it, it's ever done, if we, if we had a global sort of crowdsourcing platform for uh, climate change or something, how are you going to deal with all that inf in input? I think this can be solved technologically. So I don't, I, the size issue doesn't bother me uh, at all. The scalability aspect, the, 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 the national forum that was selected uh, randomly at the beginning of the process can also be scaled. The, the, those, the, the institutional features are completely scalable. Now the question is, okay, but what about the homogeneity that, uh, <coughs> I, same thing, I honestly think it's an empirical question that no one has the answer to, and, and I, I, I don't understand why people are so keen on just shutting, shutting the, the, the conversation by saying, look, they're, they're just too, too white and Christians, you know. Mm -hmm. This cannot work anywhere else. I think in, in, uh, in, in Egypt they tried, okay, they mm -hmm. failed. In Tunisia they had a version of that as well, and they're very divided, and yet they still want it. And you couldn't even make the case that, uh, from a justice point of view, it's precisely where the countries are, are most divided that you need to open up the process and, and make it more accountable through those mechanisms. So I, I think it's a complete, completely open question. Thank you. Uh, well, mm, uh, let, let me just say I have, I have a 
question or a comment that I can't quite articulate. Okay, go ahead. So maybe I'll wait until there isn't an audience. No, <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I, I, it wasn't so articulate anyway, so I'm just happy to... Uh, um, I'm not really sure how to... Uh, so I, I think... I think it's that I'm a little bit uncomfortable with... Um, it seems to be like a very hyper-rationalist kind of subtext to, okay. the, to the way that it's framed, the way that your argument is framed. Um, but I don't know how to... Uh, so I'm, I'm a little worried about the, the sort of disembodied conception of rationality that, right. that you have. And, and, and in particular, I'm worried about that. Um, there are... So I, I, I guess I'm trying to see what, what's driving it, and sometimes I wonder whether it's not the sort of epistemic framework where you're presuming that, the, okay, there is a truth of the matter, mm. and we're trying to figure out what procedures are going to track that truth that, that is independent of the procedures themselves. And it seems to me that there are a lot of important political questions that have to do not with um, trying to track some independent truth, but with trying to articulate... Uh, say through certain kinds of procedures, a certain identity like yes. who we want to be, mm. um, and that those kinds of things often don't take the form of, uh, or the procedures that are best suited to uh, articulating um, or expressing those kinds of questions and our answers to them don't necessarily take the form they, they're not restricted to just the propositional content of the speech that we utter. Yeah, yeah, put yeah. it that way. So it seems to me that you know part of the way that we want to figure out who we are is through various forms of narrative, through various ways of uh, interacting and seeing, uh, you know, who am I talking to? How are they carrying themselves? Mm -hmm. What is the other baggage that is? You, you know, you see yeah. what I mean? And so I, I just, I don't know how to. No, so I, I completely, I think I understand. In fact, that it's the same thing when I, when I talk about um, getting rid of the spectacle, right, of, of politics. Because in a way, it's part of the, the thing that drives us to be interested in politics. And, 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 and there's always the risk, indeed, to, to be hyper-rational. And, and OK, so the thing is, as usual, in this, I mean, as usual, in this paper, I'm strictly interested in the epistemic properties. And I, in my view, they are orthogonal to the identity building properties of deliberation. Mm -hmm. And they could come, they could, it, there could be a, a very uh, clear trade-off between the two. You might gain in, you know, in epistemic quality, um, but you'd have to lose on the, on the identity building uh, properties of, the, of that right. deliberation. Or it could be, and that would be a terrible scenario for me, that you, 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 you can only gain the epistemic properties if you keep the, well, I guess it's the same thing, if, if, you, if you maintain the, 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 the richness of people's identities in the conversation. And I, I honestly, I, I don't know. I just have a sense that, um, it, you know, you, the, the example of Gloria, like you, you try to step in the public sphere, the public eye, and then you're just smashed and made fun yeah. of. This is a very common experience. And yeah. I'm not sure that, th you know, you, you could say, well, yes, but it gives a, a chance to hear our lovely yeah. Italian accent and, and yeah. you know, and, and it, 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 it diversifies the, what we associate with the public sphere. So maybe we just need to have more women in there. But it's yeah. such a cost on an individual level that I just, I feel like being safely behind your computer and just being yeah. on this, or having an avatar or something, you know, and then <laughs> it, you can totally separate yourself <laughs> as a public figure from yourself as a, Especially in this world where everybody knows everything about you. You know, they can connect your Facebook profile yeah. to this and that. They know your age, they know your, your marital status, they know this and that. It's, it's become it's impossible to escape the, the, to have a privacy sphere. And and uh, so maybe it's complete. I think that's what two motivates two the... I think there are two different issues. Yeah. So one issue is um, what are the dynamics uh, that impose themselves on processes that are public in this way or visible in this way. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another issue about what are the appropriate modes for expression within whatever the process is, whether it is visible oh. or, or oh, not. Oh, I see. So, okay. I mean, if you take, t take an, uh, so you give the example of, you know, trolls and so on and, and people who, you know, comment on your looks and all that stuff, and you can give that example, or you take a different example, I think um, 
you know, for example, one of the problems with deliberation that uh, in Canada we've confronted is that, yeah, you can put people together, but often if you're in indigenous people, for example, they're just not going to say very much when mm -hmm. there's a lot of people, within a certain, with, when it's structured in a certain way. It, right, yeah. it's, there's not. And so the question is why? And it's not necessarily because of the publicity or I the see. visibility of it, it's because of the form of expressions and the norms of expression uh, and who's, you know, in particular, uh, you know, the, the obviously there's the power relationship, but you're kind of abstracting away from that. But but just focusing on the forms of expression that are validated. So so here's my answer. I think then in that case, I can I think I can make room for um, a more um, inclusive form of deliberation. I know I define it as exchange of arguments, but I think it's it's possible to to include narratives and uh, emotional statements as subsets of. Um, Arguments, or you know, it, as a, a model, you're not sure. You think it's distinct? Yeah. At least not in the disembodied way that I heard you talking about. Right. Uh, so I guess I, I do have this rationalist sort of tendency. So I'm not going to deny that. I, I I just hope that it can be reconciled in some ways with these other dimensions. I thought on this. So maybe extending a rationalist idea. If you want to embrace the rationalism of this, why stop? where you stop. So when you want the written transcripts so people can't see whether they have a full head of hair, something close to my heart, or um, <laughs> the body language you mentioned or whatever, then the transcript comes out. And some people are humorless, and some people are kind of clever with words. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should go one step further and have a machine that goes in and translates it all into first order logic. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a worry, right? No, no, because then, then something it seems to be missing, but no, then no, what no, about no. body language? I, I can't do that because then it becomes burdensome. It's the difference between you know, it, it needs to be something. I mean, okay, you need to read. It's already maybe too burdensome actually mm -hmm. for some for a large swath of humanity. Maybe the, the, the ability to read it would be too much to ask. Well, so, so Brad, but, so Suppose we can avoid the burden. Suppose we can avoid the burden. This looks like there's something else at stake right. here. That suppose we can translate it into very easily readable things, right. stripped of any humor or cleverness mm -hmm. with words, mm -hmm. or distinctive uh, tone of voice or whatever. And do you really want that? Some of them. You don't. Think, but then why not body good. language? Mm -hmm. It's very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the pace of someone's voice, the yeah. the way they might lift their voice at the end, sounding open to an interlocutor. That's what body language does. So, like, I don't know where you draw the line. Here. I don't know. I'm just thinking of concrete examples. I, I think that if we're going to decide, I don't know, whether to go to war in Iraq, yeah. uh, I think the body language shouldn't matter. I, I don't think some, some guy who looks more martial than, than a woman who makes a case for maybe being cautious should matter. I think that. Um, so, so I'm, I, I, I'm not a hyper rationalist like, to the point that you're suggesting. I, I do think nuances and humor matter. We're humans. But there's a way to... Um, yeah, what would be the principle of mind that avoids that, that right. absurd yeah. conclusion? I don't know. This, this sounds more like the ethics of, of deliberation or something. Yeah. Like how we mm. ought to go about communicating mm. with each other in public rather than some kind of formal structure of what deliberate, like, you know. Mm -hmm. Is that right? It doesn't mean we shouldn't have body language. It's not an ethics about how we should conduct ourselves. We will have body language and we will have tone of voice. You know? But if she's saying that like some kinds of body language shouldn't count, right? You don't want somebody who's like, especially Marshall, to be like more credible, credible on military issues. For that reason. But I just, I just think that sometimes it's, even though you want to not give you know, epistemic credit uh, to someone just based on how martial they look, you will. So a good way to to not do that is just by blindfolding you somewhat, or you know. Uh, so, uh, this is a, uh, just a thought about the generalizability of the Icelandic case. So, when I read your article, I didn't think what you were saying is, look, uh, constitutional design should be done like this everywhere. No. But look, this is a a really thoughtful, smart way of implementing policy through these discursive bodies. And so like I live in Ann Arbor, it's a great community that's more or less like educationally homogenous. Uh, I think it I think we voted for uh, Clinton over Trump with one of the highest margins of victory in, in the country. But, it, but like why couldn't we adopt 
yeah. uh, decision-making process like that. I mean, politics exists on the city level, on the state level as well. And insisting that, well, this only works in Iceland, but it can't work in the United States. Ergo, it's not a useful thought experiment. I, just, I, I, didn't, um, I, didn't, I don't know if I was reading it wrong, but I thought, like, oh, no, this is just um, a, a, an archetypal case of how we might think about discursive and deliberative practices. And so just to say, like, well, if, you know, Italians uh, just would never fly in Italy or Israel or in the United States, that's fine, but I feel like there are many other communities, smaller communities, smaller deliberative bodies that are implementing policy or coming up with, um, uh, with uh, rule-making structures of sorts for which this would be a wonderful template. Yeah, no, thank you very much. That's a probably better answer than, than, than I gave. Uh, exactly right. I think, you, you, I think it's, it's a prototype of something new that needs to be tried under different conditions and circumstances and then we'll see we'll learn more it's just it's just new it's breaking a mold I feel yeah. so. Uh, so I didn't uh, uh, I didn't get to respond when I went on oh, and on sorry. about the, the uh, public central bank thing about whether there's a difference between publicity and transparency yeah. yes there is so well, I, I so I I think publicity is making available um, uh, the <coughs> Less than transparency does. Transparency is uh, is uh, is not discriminating enough, and so you can have publicity even if it's if the process is not transparent. Yeah. Um, you could have um, as long as, for example, there's a transparency about uh, the process or something like that. Like in the case of your jury, where there's like a representative of the public that's there, so it's not transparent because nobody can see what's going on but it's still public because sure. there's a representative of the public so it's, it's somewhat vicariously available to anybody who really wants to know what, what's going on and so that's and, I, and I'm basically I, I guess it wasn't very clear but I was, I was basically pushing for a conception <coughs> of, of publicity that is very distinct from transparency um, I, I think there's a you know there's this this um, uh, idea of open government today is very fashionable and so it's also premised on the idea that everything should be made transparent and um, I'm not sure. I think that uh, you, we should distinguish between transparency of procedures and transparency of outcomes and uh, between immediate transparency and lag transparency and, and definitely publicity is even lower, I mean less demanding than that I think or should be if we want, if we want some epistemic benefits out of it. Or I, guess, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I think we're, we're done for today. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah.